Hey, let's... <laughs> Follow me. Let's all take a collective deep breath, okay? You might not need to buy something uh, just because it's there, <laughs> you know? Balancing a well-stocked pantry can mean the difference between managing the food that you will cook or just storing frozen money. And there are five benefits to having a good pantry management plan, and I'm going to show them to you today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cook's Code. Welcome back to the Carefree Cook's Code, everyone. We are live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. And look, don't ever be left out of one of my live broadcasts when you set your notifications correctly. Right under the video at the top of my page is a follow button. Click the button and follow Chef Todd more. But there's even more because once you're following me, then you can click that button barely visible pencil uh, next to notifications and choose standard to get a notification whenever I'm going live on, late, uh, on Facebook. Click done and you won't ever miss out on a live Facebook event again. And for all the past episodes, go to my video archive on Facebook or go through more than 400 videos on my YouTube channel. And now you can follow what I've been cooking for dinner along with how I did it when you follow me on my Instagram page also. <gasps> shrimp and sausage etouffee. And I gave you the 10 steps that I used. I might have to make that again on a live video. Why do I do these things? Of course, because I'm a carefree cook. Why else? I create my own recipes. I bring friends and family together or I donate food to them. Uh, I learn every time I cook. I create my own cooking style because I practice pro methods and what winds up happening I wind up loving my cooking. I love to cook. I enjoy the whole thing. And, you know, this week, if you ever thought that things were limitless, you know, like the types or the, the quantity of food that you could buy, <laughs> if you thought the amount of money that you have to spend on food is limitless, if you think that the space where you can store all that food has no limit, well, you're probably realizing right about now that these things are not they are not limitless. May, all right, maybe one of them is limitless for you. Maybe you have a barn that looks like a mini Costco somewhere, but food choices are becoming limited. Things, certainly the money that you spend on food cannot be a limitless commodity for you. So we're gonna put some common sense and some pro-level skills on managing your pantry today. But first, I've got a what am I for you. Look at those things closely want you to pay attention. <laughs> if you've been paying attention lately, you may recognize E-F-F-F-L-L-S. Is Chef Todd talking in code? <laughs> no, uh, E-F-F-F-L-L-S. If you don't know what that is, you might have missed one or two of my live baking videos lately. So uh, what's E-F-F-F-L-L-S? That's the, the what I am I today. Look, um, once again, I'm so glad that we're back together, each of us working toward our own individual carefree cooking journeys. And I really look forward to these Tuesday classes because I think we can challenge ourselves. Every Tuesday, it's what I try and do. I try and challenge you to think differently than the widely accepted ways. I mean, you need to ask questions. We need to, we need to challenge ideas. We need to experiment for ourselves and witness the answers. You know, I just, I certainly don't accept when I hear, well, that's the way it's always been done. 
You know, that's the way grandma always did it. I, I don't know. It's the way we always did it. Oh, I hate that answer so much. I just really do. When somebody tells me, oh, that's the way that it's always been done, I just see it as an opportunity to prove them wrong, you know? I just see it as an opportunity to find a new and better way to do it. You might feel the same way. You might be here for like a whole wide variety of reasons. Maybe you're just not sure how to make an Alfredo sauce. You always wanted to do that. Maybe you want to, you want to make the tomato sauce like your mom did, you know? You're, you're curious. You want to become carefree in your cooking. You want to be able to make your own Alfredo sauce, one that your grandkids are then going to go around asking people how you did it years from now, right? Start the heritage because carefree cooking is something that you can always pass on to somebody else, especially the next generation because it's something that you can do together, right? It, it, it challenges your mind so much better than a Sudoku puzzle, you know? It builds confidence better than running a marathon. It generates creativity faster than painting ever does. And the skills that come with carefree cooking, they last you a lifetime. And plus, Sudoku puzzles taste terrible. They're, they're just, you're better off cooking. But look, the really cool thing about working toward breaking the Carefree Cooks Code together, this journey that we are all on together, is for different reasons. But we all march forward. We all march forward together toward improving our lifestyles through better food and cooking because that's how you become free. And one of the greatest benefits of becoming a carefree cook is that you can cook for any diet or any desire using the same repeatable methods of cooking that chefs are taught in culinary school. And this means you can just reach into your pantry, grab a whole bunch of ingredients, and be confident in how you're going to cook them because you wind up making something really great. Cooking from the pantry, big topic right now, really hot topic. And I'm so glad everyone has finally caught up to us. <laughs> We've known about this since 2008. I started teaching pantry management in my cooking school in 2006. <laughs> I've taught this class on a college level dozens of times because the truth that comes out of all these classes is that if you want to cook from your pantry, you need to understand what's in your pantry and how you manage the space and the money there while still having the food that you need to cook with. Because the idea is not to have a mini grocery store in your house. That, that's not the way to do it. A pantry is the ingredients that you keep on hand because you're going to cook something from them. Okay, the cook part is more important than the keep it on hand part. And there's a skill in balancing a well-stocked pantry, having the items that you need on hand to whip up great meals quickly versus creating a mausoleum of food. <laughs> you know, the stacked cans like headstones in a graveyard that are never going to see the light of day. And this is a topic that I'm asked about all the time. I get, uh, almost every day I get on Facebook and I see questions like, hey, Chef Todd, uh, what are the pantry items that I should keep on hand at all time? Hey, Chef Todd, what are the best ingredients that I should have in my kitchen? I act this is actually true. Hey, Chef Todd, what's in your panties? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a true comment I got. I would like to know what to keep in my panties. That's an autocorrect problem. Please, you should always proofread your questions before you send them to me, or you might get a response you really don't want to hear. We cracked up at that one. All right, so you want to know what's in my panties? I mean, my pantry, you know? I've thought about this topic a lot, and I, I, I've had a lot of trouble sometimes trying to put this straight into my mind because I don't want to sit here and read you a whole list of pantry items that you should have in your kitchen because ultimately you have to decide what to keep in your pan pantry. <sighs> now you got me doing it, you know? I'll get read your messages before you send them to me, please. It could get very embarrassing. Look, I don't know what flavor combinations you like, you know? I, I don't know what ethnic or regional influences are on your food. I, I don't know what you like to eat. You know, these are the things that are entirely up to you. I don't keep sardines 
in my pantry. You might love them. I don't. I've got four different kinds of mustard in my fridge right now. That might be at least three too many for you. I mean, I could give you some generalities. I can give you ideas of the things that most people keep on hand, but ultimately it's up to you to make the changes that you want. And reading a list of ingredients to you today might be educational, but it's going to be really boring. And, and I don't like to bore you. And since I'm always trying to bring you the secrets that are taught in culinary school, the techniques that professionals use that you then steal and put into your own home, I want you to start thinking about your pantry like a food vault. Okay, think about a huge amount of food, not just the food that you have, but this is the way I thought about it when I was ordering food for a large hospital, which I've done. I was the executive chef at a very large hospital and I used to buy $1.5 million worth of food every month when I served as the executive chef there. A million and a half a month. Can you imagine? That's a lot of food to keep track of. We had a huge pantry, a gigantic room. We used to use forklifts to put the food up on the shelves. And we even had a pantry steward, a guy whose full-time job it was to fulfill the requisitions of food and keep the inventory of the food. And our guy, I, I don't remember his name. Oh, he was such a pain, this guy. I was the one buying all the food. I was the one spending a million and a half dollars, but he got to control it. He got to distribute it. And I used to joke, I used to tell my staff, he's like the troll under the bridge. You know, my line cooks would come to me for food and I'd be like, go ask the troll. You know, the guy behind the half door, you got to go ask him stuff. And they'd go over to the, to the entrance, to the pantry. Hey, Joe, you know, hey, can I get a can of tomatoes? Ah, you must answer this riddle first. What? <laughs> what has wings but does not fly? What lays but never down? What is afraid of all things? Joe, you ask me this every time I come here. It's a chicken. It's always a chicken. Now stop the games and give me my darn tomatoes. It's not really how it went. <laughs> that, that's not even the real guy. I got this guy off Google. But it's the first point I want to make. In your home, you're the pantry steward. And you're the chef. You requisition things from your own cabinet and use them in your cooking. But do you keep track of it like a pantry steward does? Do you know how much of something that you use over a certain period of time? Do you know how often you purchase something? Do you know the value of all the items in your kitchen cabinets right now? Do you think it would shock you? what the dollar value of these things are? These are the questions that I would have to answer every single week as the executive chef of a large hospital. Because if I kept too much food on hand, my food cost would rise. My budget is gone. If I kept too little food on hand, I might run out. Running out is not good in a hospital as the executive chef, or at least I wouldn't have as many options. There were two things I never, I tried never to run out of for some reason. Well, first of all, was all the medical things, the formulas for the children, the thickening agents for the adults, the dysphagia people and so on. Um, but one time, I, and I tried, I set my pars on that really, really high because I try never to run out. It's important. The other thing that I remember was lasagna. I remember specifically a lasagna day and we made dozens and dozens of pans of lasagna and I hadn't ordered enough lasagna noodles, I had to go to the grocery store and buy every box of lasagna noodles they had in the grocery store. I wiped them out, but the cost of that lasagna, the difference between me buying, you know, 50 pound boxes from the distributor and going and filling a shopping cart destroyed my budget for the week. It's a delicate balance, you know, between having usable inventory on hand and having unused inventory. And this is the difference between profit and loss in a commercial establishment. And that's why I want to share professional 
pantry secrets with you today in this class. Everybody is telling you to keep quinoa on your shelf or sardines. I don't know why. It, do it doesn't matter what. I want you to get the systems down. And some of what I share with you today might seem a bit much <laughs> for your home kitchen, or you might choose to use some of these ideas and really take control of your food and your money by employing some of these pro-level skills today. So let's get started. Let's talk about the benefits of good pantry management. First, of course, it's having the stuff on hand so you can cook by method using the flavors that you like and apply them to your creation. Okay, so no matter how you choose to cook, you gotta have some stuff on hand, right? Second is reducing trips to the market. This is especially important now. You can lower your food bill when you make less trips. Unproven all the time. And nowadays we don't want to go to the market as much, right? So I'll show you how to limit your market trips. Or if the market's far from you, think about the time and gas that you save not driving back and forth. If you cut these trips in half for the things that you forgot and have to go back for even. And that brings us to narrowing the scope of the items that you store. Thoughtful planning in your pantry means that you don't have unused items. They take up space. You only want to keep the items that you're going to use in the immediate future. It's, it's called SKUs, S-K-U's, in retail, in executive chefing. I, I don't need three kinds of tomato sauce. I might not even need tomato sauce because I have tomatoes. You get the idea? The next thing is know the value of all the food items that you have on hand. You can't manage a food budget if you got hundreds of dollars sitting around in your cabinet that you're not making meals from. And then what you want to do is have the ability to create a shopping list, an idea of the cycle that you're on, the, the, the cycle that you know how often you use each item, how often you have to purchase it, your purchase frequency. And there's one more thing I need to add to this uh, because of recent events. You need an acceptable substitutions list. You need to have an idea of what you might um, have to accept, right? What you might have to choose if your pantry item isn't available. If you ever purchase groceries online, uh, you'll see they often ask you for an acceptable substitution. And really, this is one of the superpowers, right, of being a carefree cook. Because when you can identify methods of cooking, then you can figure out the best ingredients to apply to that cooking method. It's, it's another thing recipes never do for you. Because in method cooking, you can always find a substitution if the store is out. So these five benefits of managing your food vault, it can make your cooking easier, quicker, give you actual more variety and save you money as well. So how do we do this? How do you choose your pantry items? Well, in a commercial kitchen, the pantry is built from the recipes and the recipes are derived from the menu. The executive chef of the establishment writes the menu he breaks it down into the ingredients needed, and then he creates the inventory of the things that he or she, <laughs> to be fair, he or she needs, right? From the menu to the ingredient list is how it goes to your inventory. And since I know my hospital menu, when I was executive chef at the hospital, I know it many weeks in advance because it's a cycle menu. I just go down each standardized recipes, ingredients. I make a shopping list, and that becomes my pantry list, the things I always have to have. But in your home kitchen, you're probably not writing a cycle menu for the next five weeks, right? You're probably not based on standardized recipes. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> and you don't have 60 cooks and chefs that must duplicate things precisely based on specifications or the demands of a nutritionist, right? You're a carefree cook. You're cooking by method. You're throwing stuff together. So you need to figure out what you've got on hand and cook it in a dependable, repeatable, reliable method. And this, this actually makes your pantry, creating the pantry so much harder. How can you know what ingredients you're going to need three days from now, seven days from now, two weeks from now? How do you know this stuff, Chef Todd? I'm not an executive chef of a hospital. Well, look, you don't know. You're never going to know. But you can sure as heck make a guess at it. You know, we all have a basic repertoire of foods that we cook again and again, don't we? I mean, we all do it. 
no matter the size or the, the variety of the foods that you cook, you always come back to a few fa favorites. You may not have a cycle menu, but I bet you, you have a food cycle. Everybody, everybody has a food cycle. And if you're aware of your food cycle, then you can start ordering stuff like an executive chef with an eye on the budget without running out of anything and always having stuff to cook. And what I mean by your cycle is not the exact dishes, but just the fact that like you're going to make rice. Okay. Over a week or two, you're going to make rice. So have rice in your pantry. Rice is a pantry item. Maybe uh, you make a lot of beans. I like black beans. I keep a lot of black beans on hand. Maybe you make more black bean stuff or Mexican cooking more than anybody else. Maybe you do more stir fries than your neighbor does. So you know there are certain items that you buy all the time, certain items that you're going to use multiple times in your cooking cycle in between the market trips, right? So if you're really trying to avoid exposure at the market, right? If you're trying not to go there as often, knowing what you buy and how often you buy things is a fantastic way to arm yourself. Spread out your shopping trips with the executive chef level of pantry management skills. And this is how you build your own personal inventory of the pantry items that you need, giving consideration to the days in between new food deliveries, food delivery is a good idea, or your shopping trip. So at the hospital, or when I was a chef at the National Security Agency and I was cooking for thousands of people, I had a clipboard with some 50 pages on it. And every Friday I would take inventory. I would have to count each and every item in this huge kitchen every Friday. How many of each do I have on hand? How many will I use until the next order? And from that comes the food order for the week. And it's a simple formula for your par number. It goes like this. It's the amount that you always want to have on hand, your par number, right? Minus the inventory, what you do have on hand, Plus, unless you're going to go get it yourself, any usage until your food or water arrives. Sometimes that was a day or two, right? So this creates your shopping list. Whether you've got a few bags from the grocery store that you throw in your truck, or like me, had a 40 foot semi trailer deliver 12 pallets of food every week to your huge production kitchen, right? No matter how big or how small the food operation is, all inventories, all the inventories that you take are going to be broken down into categories. So now's when you might want to start writing stuff down or come back to this page, watch the replay video, take some screenshots, or like I showed you at the beginning, go to uh, Chef Todd Moore videos section on Facebook. So we're going to go over the categories. The categories to create your pantry go like this. First, dry goods. These are the shelf stable items, the things like the rice, the dried beans, the grains, cereal, dried fruits, nuts, pasta, lentils, I said beans, right? Beans, your uh, dried herbs and spices. Also includes anything from the bake shop, uh, flour, sugar, baking soda, cornstarch, cocoa powder, dry yeast, powdered milk, things like that. These are all things that are great to have in your pantry because they really never go bad. They're dry goods. They don't go bad until they get wet and then they're wet goods. And there's no such thing as wet goods. So they're no goods if, oh, never mind. Next is canned goods. And <laughs> this is self-explanatory. These are things in a can or a jar, canned vegetables or fruits, canned soups, canned meats, canned tuna, canned uh, or cartoned broths, canned juices. Again, these items with a long shelf life, write down all your canned goods. The next category, fats, oils, flavoring, all your oils, olive oil, all your honeys and vinegars, your syrups, uh, the condiments, the jellies, the sauces, uh, <clears throat> um, the flavoring items, the soy sauce, all those things that you use. Now, they go bad a little more quickly than dry goods and canned goods. So if you're setting pars for these, these par items are generally a little lower. The quicker they go bad, the, the less you want to keep on hand because the quicker they go bad. Then you want your refrigerated items. This is fresh produce, fruits and vegetables, uh, egg, dairy products, fresh meats, butter, uh, yogurt, uh, things like that. These 
are the most perishable items. And, you know, like if your electricity goes out or something like that, these things are goners, right? So they're refrigerated items and generally the lowest inventory because they do perish that quickly and the highest turnover. You want to turn these items quickly. I'll explain about turned items in a minute. Next is frozen items. These are the meats and proteins or breads or bread doughs, frozen vegetables, frozen fruit, things like that. These also have a long shelf life in frozen, but they do deteriorate in the freezer. They get freezer burn, they dry out. And again, if somehow you lose electricity, they're all shot as well. So a little less inventory of the freezer as well. So from these five categories, go looking through your house, assign everything to a category, start putting these categories together because that's when you start building your pantry list and here's how you do it. Go through your kitchen, write down every single thing that you see in your cabinets, everything you see in your freezer, everything you see in your refrigerator, because these are the things that you bought in the past and probably the things you're going to buy in the future. Take it and assign everyone to a category. This is how you've got the start to your pantry list. You don't have a menu like an executive chef does, but you have a history of the things that you've bought because you're looking at your pantry, right? Then go ahead and review that list and eliminate anything that's been there for a long time. Uh, you know, we had this foray into uh, somebody gave us venison. You know, I hear this a lot. What am I going to do with that venison that's been in the freezer for two years? And things like that. You don't need venison uh, on your pantry list unless it's a staple of your diet. Eliminate these things that you don't regularly uh, eat from the list and from your pantry. Uh, you know, get rid of the venison, <laughs> do something with it and donate it. And then you can look around and add items that you'd like to include in the pantry for the future. You might start eating differently at this time. You might start eating healthier. You might, you might actually start eating sardines and, and uh, orzo uh, 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 quinoa. <laughs> you might start eating sardines and quinoa. Heck, I don't know. But what you're going to do is arrive at your pantry list, okay? These are the items that you are currently cooking with and the ones that you're going to be using in the future. You can review this list every month or every few months if you want. Every year, you know, it doesn't matter, but eliminate unused items and add new used ones. It's a, a continual process. Remember, I did this weekly for a quarter of a million dollars worth of food, you know? Certainly you can do it once or twice a year to keep your pantry lean and mean. Everything goes through food trends, right? Everybody goes through trends in their cooking. Maybe you just figured out how to make the best beef stroganoff ever and you find yourself making it two to three times a month. Well, you need to add some beef, uh, some dry egg noodles, some sour cream, right? For when the inspiration hits you, but then you're sick of it. You know, you're sick of beef stroganoff <laughs> or you move on to something new. You, f you discover how to cook in a Thai style. So get rid of the sour cream, bring in some coconut milk to your pantry, add that sriracha sauce, bring in some peanut butter, right? Get rid of uh, the mushrooms for the stroganoff until you get sick of the Thai cooking and you discover something else. No need to keep the egg noodles if you're not going to use them up, right? No need to keep buying packages of egg noodles every week because here's the big idea to put in your head. It might not exactly apply to the home cooking, but the big idea of what I teach in culinary school. And in culinary school, uh, this class is called Purchasing Food Costing and Inventory Management. <laughs> Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Purchasing food costing and inventory management. I've taught the class about 20 times. It's a 50 hour class. That's right, 50 hours talking about the pantry, okay? But the main idea in managing a restaurant or a food establishment is this one thought that I drill into my students' head all the time and it's this. In the back door, through the kitchen, and out the front door as quickly as possible. That is the mantra of management, of pantry management. And what this means is anything that I purchase as an executive chef, it better get cooked and turned into money as fast as possible, or I won't have money to buy more food with. You get the idea? The cycle in the back door through the chef's hands 
and through the cash register, right? It's probably a better way to say it because if I buy food and I put it on the shelf and I don't cook with it, it actually costs me money. And that food that's sitting on your shelf, it costs you money. And the next week you go buy more food and you put it right next to that other food without turning it into a meal, without selling it. And if you do this week after week, you got a huge pantry and no sales, no meals, to show for the food that you've been buying. And I'd probably be out of a job because I'd be a horrible executive chef if I did that. I, I did a consulting job many years ago. Somebody came, their, their food cost was out of control. It was a, a college actually close to here. Their food cost was out of control. They, they wanted to know, you know what the issue would be. I opened their freezer. There had to be $100,000 worth of food in the freezer chickens and steaks and vegetables. That's where your food, your, your, your money is. The good news is you're not going to have to spend money on food for like three months. All right. So let me ask you, are you doing this? Are, is this you? Do you have a huge pantry and only a few meals? Because good pantry management does not mean being a hoarder. It doesn't mean storing everything possible in case you might use it because those are the things you never use. Those are the things that the recipe commanded you to go out and buy two years ago and you haven't used it since. A good pantry has the items that you consistently use that you will use in the future or that you want to use soon because it's not supposed to be a museum of food. <laughs> the things that you grabbed because they were on sale or because they were available. And this is a number that executive chefs are judged by. It's called inventory turns. And you don't have 50 hours today. I know that. But briefly, turns is the number derived by dividing the value of the inventory by the sales dollars for the same period. The idea is, excuse me, you want to turn your entire inventory over as quickly as possible. And a turn number, the higher the number means the, the more quickly you're turning the food into money or into meals. A lower inventory turn means you're storing too much and you're not selling it. Okay, we don't need to get into that, but this concept, this whole concept can be applied to your home kitchen in a very advanced way that you may or may not want to put into use or you might just want to keep these ideas in your head, okay? Be aware of these concepts as you get ready to shop because my suggestion here is that you go ahead and make yourself a spreadsheet. If you're watching me today, you're a little bit computer savvy, okay? So create a spreadsheet of all the pantry items like I've shown you and their cost. Add the pantry items to the sheet, transfer the cost to the cash register receipt from your shopping, and you'll know the, the cost of your items. If a can of tomato sauce is $2.79, that means you got $2.79 worth of tomato sauce in your pantry, right? If you only have half a jar, then divide that in half. You get how it is. Do this for every item and you'll know how much money is tied up in your pantry. You might be shocked. And this is the other side of the food vault. It's the money freezer. It's frozen money. If you add up the value of everything you have, you're going to be shocked. And let me ask you this, could you use that money for something else? Perhaps you realize that you can use more fresh ingredients because you turn them over quickly. Or maybe you realize you need more canned goods because you can't get to the, the store that quickly, right? So figure out your par items, buy less of the lettuce, buy more of the canned goods perhaps. Remember my lasagna noodles, right? I didn't want to run out of lasagna noodles. I want to have all these things. It's beneficial to have a good pantry cycle. Remember in the back door, through the kitchen and out the front door as quickly as possible. Or from the home cook's perspective, from the market onto the plate and in the stomach <laughs> as fast as possible. So let me ask you this. If you were to go through your house, if I came to your house, would you be a little embarrassed by your pantry? Are there things that you've been keeping in there that, that could be donated to your local food bank instead, perhaps? You know, instead of frozen money, how about putting some of that money to work for somebody else? And you got some extra time to review your pantry this week. Go ahead and make your par item list of the things you really do need and donate the rest to your food bank.
That's what you should do. All right, let's get back to the what am I. The E, F, 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 L, L, S is everything you could ever bake. If you were with me on the Baking Lives last week, you realize it's eggs, flour, fat, flavor, liquid leavener, and sugar that gets you there. If you haven't seen those videos, go back and see the two baking videos. They're really, really cool. And look, if you know someone with way too much frozen money in their pantry, please share this video with them. Give it a thumbs up so Facebook knows you love it also. And I need to take another minute before you go, <laughs> before we leave, let me, let me just have your attention for a minute before we all head back to our kitchens and before we all start scrutinizing your pantries, because I know I put it in your head today, I want you to take a minute and realize how fortunate you are for the food you do have in your pantry, how fortunate you are for the food that is stored away for tomorrow, and I want you to realize, please, how many people don't know where tomorrow's food is coming from. I wanna introduce you to Chef Jose Andres. He is the founder of World Central Kitchen, and I'm sure he would like to thank you because you've been donating to World Central Kitchen, and you probably don't realize it. I know you don't realize it. Because anyone who has purchased anything from web cooking classes this year has contributed to his incredible cause. More publishing, Heather and I, web cooking classes, we have made a commitment toward monthly contributions to the World Central Kitchen because food is the most basic need. And you're starting to see how valuable food is lately, aren't you? It's even more value, valuable when you don't have any. And this week, World Central Kitchen passed 2 million meals served in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. They're continuing to expand their food uh, relief operations in cities all across America. They are currently serving 160,000 meals a day. And Chef Andre, I wanted to tell you about this because this is amazing. He has also just announced a commitment to purchase 1 million meals, 1 million meals from small local restaurants so he can bring them back to work safely. This is the whole idea behind this because World Central Kitchen is going to take those meals and they're going to deliver it to their partners, their facilities for seniors, for frontline healthcare workers and more. And with all that's going on around us, I understand the frustration of feeling like you really want to help, but not knowing what to do. So if it's within your means, no matter how small or how large, consider making a donation to World Central Kitchen today. This is a totally apolitical movement, okay? somewhere where your donation goes into a hungry mouth as quickly as possible. So go to donate.wck.org. Donate.wck.org. You might also recognize Chef Andre because he was on 60 Minutes Sunday night. And if you want to know more about his cause before you donate, you should watch that episode of 60 Minutes. He's an amazing chef. He's got a massive food effort that's keeping thousands of people fed. Thank you for being with me today, everyone. Until next Tuesday, where we take even more steps toward breaking the Carefree Cooks Code, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your generous cooking success. Bye-bye, everyone.